G'day champions, it's Thirsty Thursday already, and look what we got here, we got a Marshall 2203 JMP style head. Uh, this is probably the amp I'd go out and buy if I won the lotto. <laughs> They're worth a fair bit, they're worth a pretty penny now, they're pretty sought after. This one, the customer found, a bit of a bargain, um, because it's got some issues. So let's crack her open and have a look. Just on the video note, I uh, hope it's sounding a little bit better. We've upgraded the mic, got an audio technica on the camera up there now, stereo mic. Uh, hopefully the noise floor is a bit lower. I'll get a lapel mic one of these days, but you know. So, quick look at the top. It's got the JMP style handle with the metal ends, beautifully corroded. It's got the plastic um, vent on the top, which is uh, inevitably broken. And it's got a crack through here and the corners break off all the time but it's still holding in place and it's got that vintage charm if the customer wants to replace it we can still source a equivalent of that and replace it but it's still holding in, holding in place if it rattles or something we may look into it but otherwise it'll probably stay as is so here's the back i just took a moment to cover up the previous repair tech sticker i don't like putting stickers on amps i each to their own but I used to get my car serviced by this uh, this one mechanic. No matter how many times I told them, don't put your sticker on the back, they'd put their sticker on the back. And it just got really got to me one time when I took the car there and it already had a sticker on the back. I hadn't taken it off yet. I took it there for another service and they put another sticker next to that one. Like my car's their billboard and they're not giving me a discount for it. Well, I hate that. So I don't put stickers or any markings at all in my amp. I give good documentation of the owner they're free to pass that on to the next owner if they want to but it's entirely up to them i don't put any markings on amps at all you see some text and they write with texture on the inside of the chassis don't do that that's just this graffiti it's not your it's not your possession anyway i don't know what horrors we're going to find in this and i don't want to blame on this this person um even if they're still around i don't know um if someone else has done stuff after they had it so Moving on, inevitably we've got some modifications on these things. It's really hard to find an original one, and if you do, they, they certainly go for a pretty penny. Someone put a fan in it at one point. Makes you wonder why. Um, pretty much every other 100 watt Marshall head does fine without a, without a fan. But anyway, uh, so 2203, we've got the original uh, placard here. We've got red texture around the speaker outlets, which is interesting. Not sure what that's about. We've got an aftermarket impedance selector with a plastic shafted switch. That's probably one of those cheapies from uh, Altronics or JCAR or something. And texture there showing the, uh, the impedance. We've got the original voltage selector, which I'm assuming has been bypassed because they've written 240 volt there. We're going to return them to stock. I've got some that fit that size um, pretty authentic to the original and we're going to see if we can get rid of this texture in this this uh, tape goop in the area uh, and return it to looking stock at least from this end on we can't do much about the the hole for the fan switch or whatever it was but uh but at least uh, on this side we can we can make it authentic to the original so it looks like the uh, rear panel screws have been replaced uh, they're missing the cup washer they look to be stainless screws probably nice and decent quality uh, but we'll chuck some new stainless cup washers on there just to distribute the load a bit more evenly when we put it back together so we'll whack the back cover off and see what awaits us now as usual in these videos I know you've all got short attention spans so we'll do part one assessing the thing and coming up with a plan part two the actual repair and a test I think that's nice and neat and tidy and splits the videos up into about 30 minute blocks give or take if you like that format let me know if you don't like it let me know in a polite manner please that'd be nice for once so first look hmm all right so two missing el34s obviously that's the first thing we noticed um, the existing ones have vacuum uh, the getter is Almost completely gone on that one, probably just from age more than a leak. The preamp valves are on a funky angle, and so are their uh, sockets. So 
I'm not sure if something's taken a hit there or if that was just shock. You'd imagine if there was shock, there'd be some distortion around the transformers, but they appear to be flat, so maybe that's just been shoved by something at some point. I don't know. Um, at first, I wasn't sure if that grill was stock. Looks a little too pristine. But yeah, it might be. It's got a little bit of a bow to it, but yeah, might be original. So let's remove the chassis screws. We'll slide this thing out and see what's inside. All right, so we've got two missing uh, screws on the bottom there, but I've got some stainless replacements that I can replace them with. So I know I say this every time, but number three Phillips, please, for the Marshall chassis screws. There they are. So those screw heads are nice, uh, almost like when they were first manufactured. A little bit, a little bit chewy there, but pretty good. If you use a number two Phillips and a driver, like a impact driver, you're just going to ream them out. So just do it by hand using one of these. These are everywhere. You can get them in any hardware store, I think internationally. So just get one. Simple. All right, so a quick look at the chassis. It looks kind of tiny down there, doesn't it? In my little hands. I think we better zoom in a touch. So it's got the typical corrosion that you see on almost every Marshall top of the chassis on a older amp nothing much to worry about but we'll clean it up while we have a chance a little bit of spillage there by the looks of it through the top vent that uh, spring is misaligned you got to watch that when you when you put preamp valves in see the uh, spring there it's not sitting on the valve tip that's a good way to break the tip off the valve and lose vacuum That one's still intact, however. That's good. The sockets are pretty funky. And they're riveted. They're sort of starting to crack around where the rivets are, and the rivets are rusty. So we might look at doing uh, doing some socket replacements here, because I think they're, they're not great, despite being made in Britain. Still holding on tight, though. But... Um, yeah, I just don't like those rivets looking like they're about to let go. So onto the output valves. This might have been an attempt to run the thing at 50 watts. Um, that's doable. You just, you got to watch that you match the impedance on the output. It's doable with some amp models. Some don't like it. So to Svetlana. 0209. I'm not sure if that's 2009 or 2002 year. Um, you see the the getter flash is sort of pulled back on that one, and it's pretty pretty see through in that area as well. The other one looks a bit better, so that usually indicates either it's run too hot or that it's slightly gassy, and the getter's done its job of absorbing any gas that leaked in so far. But eventually, there's none left, and it can't do anything. Uh, I've quoted for a full new set on this, so we can return it back to its 100 watt operation and have a fresh set of valves as a known starting point. Right, so we've got all daily filter caps, dated 28th week of 75. So they're all coming out. They're almost 10 years older than I am. So while we've got the caps out, um, we'll go over the chassis and clean it. Obviously, we'll leave the transformers and the choke in place, but uh, it just gives us a bit more room to move and get around everything and clean the top of the chassis as best we can just to get that gunk off so it doesn't continue to corrode. So let's flip her over and look at the bottom. Hmm. All right, so overall, no real horror show. Having a quick glance. Starting to see some bulging in the middle of the caps there as expected. Ah. All right, well, let's go from power side over.
that there is a broken fuse holder. So that needs replacing. Fuse appears intact though. <laughs> because it wasn't. Oh, the other one's broken too. Isn't that lovely? So two new fuse holders. And the tips come off that fuse. So it's just pulled the wire out so we can't really tell if that uh that was blown or not. Oh, there's the rest of the wire hanging out, so probably not. But yeah, two new fuse holders. <laughs> it's that problem's easy to find. And do you notice anything missing here? Go on. Hurry up. First correct guess wins a shout. Here's a missing screen grid resistor, isn't there? Right there. You got one, two, three, and none on that one. So uh, that might just be a fatigue thing, but it's not in the it's not in the chassis. So it's broken off, and someone's taken it out, but um, not felt the need, not felt compelled to replace it. <laughs> So yeah, we'll, we'll fix that. Here's the impedance selector switch. That's probably not rated for the current that is expected of it in this application. But uh, that's coming out anyway. It's got a little, someone's made up a little brass adapter plate or something down there from something else. And all that's gone bye-bye. This switch, they've just put a link wire on there to hardwire it to 240 volts. And looks like the speaker jacks may be original. So yeah, not not too bad overall. No fire or anything, but yeah, a fair bit of fair bit of broken stuff, probably just from fatigue here, from the plastic just going brittle over time. Probably not actually, you know, physical damage. But yeah, so they've got to be replaced. So looking down here at the, the power switch. Um, that's obviously been replaced at some point too. It's deeper than the... Oh, it's not sure. Might be deeper than the original one. But yeah, we've got burns on the jacket there. And just tack soldering um, with insufficient solder. No, no coverage there at all. It's barely holding on. So we'll redo all of that. Hopefully there's enough length in that wire that we don't have to replace anything. There are burn marks over here as well. It's just a, a text giveaway that someone, Shaky Shakyson, has been in here and uh, done some damage. Seems like they never watch where their barrel of their soldering iron is. They just look at the tip and that's it. So someone's played knifey spoony here before too. Big globs of solder. Burnt insulation. Just general wrinkly, horrible work. So I'll redo all of that. We'll replace these bias caps, check that the pot's functioning okay. If it doesn't clean up, we'll, uh, we'll replace it. Okay, so from the input end, looking at the pots, they all appear to be original. So we'll see how they perform. There's a few replacement knobs. Um, got the ones there with the pointer, the originals. They've got a tiny little pointer beak, I guess, on there. And this one's been replaced at some point and that's got no pointer. And that's got an Allen key adjuster. Whereas these have the uh, rusty flat blade screws. This one's probably about to self-destruct. You can see the crack there, like it's been over tightened. So we'll replace that one. And the first volume has already been replaced as well. So this shits me a little bit. They've written their bloody transformer primary resistances inside the chassis like a notepad's that expensive was this last service during the great notepad famine of 1989 was it <laughs> just write it on a piece of paper for fuck's sake so anyway let's just let's see how accurate they were so on the right hand side 19.5 ohms. What's this measuring? Zero. 0.1 ohm. 
<laughs> close enough. Um, on the other side, 21.7. So a bit out. You probably find that when this amp heats up, heats up, those resistances will raise somewhat. So you should test it with a pretty warm amp because that's where they spend the majority of their life operating when they're warm. All right, so we'll remove this impedance selector and it's finger tight. Not that you can do much more than that with a plastic bushing, but anyway, this is another thing that bugs me. People put the lock washer under the nut. It's not its job. Put it between the bushing and the chassis so the actual unit can't move and then put the nut on the outside with a washer. That's the way they're meant to be. Almost everyone does it wrong. So this is an alpha switch. Don't know the rating. Doesn't tell you anywhere, so we couldn't tell. But anyway, it's coming out because we've got the authentic thing here. One of those beauties. This actually does have a rating, 6.3 amp at 250 volt. 10 amp at 250 volt. What? Don't know, mate. It's got two different ratings on there. <laughs> and they both say AC, so I'm not sure. Normally, switches will have an AC and a DC rating. DC being significantly derated because uh, it's hard to break a DC arc, whereas AC breaks itself when it passes through zero. But yeah, it's got two ratings on the one switch. So I don't know if they're for different standards. You've got the, is that Inertech? Have a close look, let's nerd out, eh? On the ratings. So UR, I can't remember what that means. <laughs> and I think that's the Inertech. I don't know, I'll look it up. All right, so we've got ENEC certification up here. So that's the recognized rating for them. These bunch of champions. And over here we've got the RU or UR, which is uh, UL recognized, not UL listed. Uh, UL recognized, which means it's okay to be installed into a piece of UL listed equipment, as opposed to being a piece of equipment itself. At least that's the gist I got from uh, about 1.3 minutes of Googling. But point being, it's listed at all, whereas this thing isn't, at least not on its plastic molding um, so yeah you probably trust this one a bit more it's not your average backyard operation that's going to laser etch on the back of a uh, baker light one-off design and there's the little two-prong choo that goes in the voltage selector mm, not super safe because if that's half out and you know a guitar string or something falls in there well, it becomes live, doesn't it? But we'll, I'll talk to the customer if he wants that just disconnected and hardwired to 240 volts so there's no threat of accidentally changing it or that pulling out or a safety issue. But either way, cosmetically, we're going to install this and set it to 240 volts so it looks like the real deal from the back. Now, there's not a lot we can do about this. That was a grommet on a previously drilled hole, not very round hole that uh, would have taken the, the cable to the fan, however they derive that voltage. Uh, we could put a blanking plug in there, like a, a, a bung sort of thing, like a grommet without a hole, and put one in there and remove that dymo label. That's about all we can really do there. So let's take stock. What are we get, What are we gonna do? We're gonna recap it. Uh, we're gonna replace that screen grid. It might replace all of them. We'll see how they're going drift-wise. We're gonna clean up the grid wires. Uh, we're going to see if there's any strangeness. We're going to clean the pots, see how they perform, clean up all the solder joints wherever we don't like them, see if we're going to replace one or all of these preamp valve sockets. Look at some lead dress changes, maybe some coax for some higher gain, um, stability and, and low noise. Uh, look for the typical Marshall, uh, Grant, Marshall ground loop situ and see if we can clean up any of that and see how the existing valves perform other than the outputs we're just going to replace them because we've only got two out of four anyway uh, but we'll see how the preamps go uh, the 12ax7s and if they're okay we can still use them but um but yeah we'll we'll uh cross that bridge when we come to it
we're going to replace these switches, uh, that switch, and uh, do something with the mains. Select a switch, whatever the customer wants there. Probably just clean up these connections too. Get rid of melted insulation if there's enough length on the wire, because that is mains, um, unfused mains straight there with melted insulation, so that's not great. We're going to replace the two fuse holders. We'll try and find something with a squarish back on it if we can. I don't like our chances, but we might might get lucky there and try to make it look as original as possible um, and just make it a good specimen basically make it rip so uh i'll get a couple of bits ordered and join us on the next episode champions that was pretty quick but you know it happens <laughs> you can get a pill for that i've heard but um join us if you've got absolutely nothing better to do and uh or if you've just got a fetish for australian accents and we'll we'll get our hands dirty on this little bad boy.